you need to create systems for nurturing loon shots inside your team and inside your company. And that creating that system is very tricky. How do you balance wanting to have, you know, artists who are working on wild new ideas that can change how people see the world, you know, artist science, creative science, where you want things to fail. Because if you're not failing, you have a very big problem. You're not taking enough risk. It is the duty of leaders to lead, of the creative to create, of the daring to do. The free world expects leadership of us. Its fate and our fate depends upon our leadership. We are industrious, inventive, restless, with the fires that burn within us. But I say that nothing is easy, and the best things are the hardest. And all our troubles, all our immense difficulties, now and in the future, can I say, be solved if we have the will, the courage. I'm really thrilled to welcome Safi to today's uh, fireside chat. Uh, Safi is not just the author of Wall Street Journal bestselling book, Loon Shots, but he is an accomplished and very successful biotech entrepreneur and a second generation physicist. What you would really call, and what we at Startup Health define as a real health transformer. Loon Shots was published two years ago um, in 2019. It's now been translated into 18 languages. It's been selected as the best business book of the year by so many organizations from Bloomberg to the Financial Times to Forbes to the Washington Post. And it was actually the number one most recommended book of the year in B Bloomberg's annual survey of CEOs and entrepreneurs. Safi, it's great to be here with you today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, uh, I was chatting with you before the, uh, before the session and we were talking about, um, you know, I first time I read Loon Shots was in 2019 when it first came out. I, I pre-ordered it. I was excited about it. I'd heard you speak on a podcast back uh, before it was published and then was really excited to dig in. Um, and then all of a sudden uh, with the pandemic a year ago, I feel like it took a completely, you know, theoretical idea looking hit backwards and it put it into full practice. And so my first question is you obviously spent a long time writing it uh, based on a lot of your own experiences and observations. But um, when you look back and think about the book that you wrote in 2019 and how you've seen it play out, What's been your biggest either surprise or insight about loon shots in action, specifically with the vaccine? Uh, I guess the biggest surprise for me from the book was just how much it resonated emotionally for people, um, how much the stories resonated, how many people told me they cried when they read it, that in a good way. <laughs> Um, I wasn't quite aware that it would have that kind of impact on people, but there are a lot of people who are pursuing wild, crazy dreams and get told no all the time and get told by experts that there's no way that could possibly work. And the stories there, in addition to the principles and the physics and the science and the history, but the stories of so many people who in hindsight we identify as great innovators and leaders, how for years and decades, they were ridiculed just the same, whether it was Steve Jobs or Kepler or, um, you know, the stories in World War II or the rise and fall of Pan Am, that the most important ideas um, are often exactly the ones that people dismiss. And you can establish moonshots, which are a destination. Moonshot is a big goal, a destination that everybody gets excited about. But the way you get there is by nurturing these loon shots, these seemingly crazy ideas. So that I was kind of surprised to see how it resonated emotionally with people and inspired people from kind of so many different industries who have reached out to me over the last couple of years. Um, you know, you, you, obviously are known for being a second generation physicist, both your parents uh, are physicists, were physicists. And uh, I can't imagine what it was like growing up, uh, dinner table conversation. Take us back. What was it like being a child of two physicists? And then, you know, even what would uh, encourage you and, and, and kind of have you go down that same path yourself? Uh, I think one of the things you learn in 
science and certainly growing up in a family of scientists is two things, to value curiosity and to value truth, the pursuit of truth, how to find truth, how to separate signal from noise, but even more importantly, how to ask good questions, how to stay curious. And uh, for me, over the course of a bunch of different career paths, when I was either academic science, and then I was in the consulting world working with large companies, and I was at a startup starting a company, then we took it public and ran it as a public company for a bunch of years. Um, and now, you know, I spend time with CEOs and boards and leadership teams on strategy and innovation and with the Department of Defense and national security companies. In each of those cases, curiosity and learning was for me a powerful driver. Whenever I felt myself not being curious on a Monday morning about what I might learn this week or that day, then it became clear to me it might be time for a change. And as long as I was still curious, I would be working hard, I'd be having fun. And so that principle, I think I got from my parents about love of curiosity, love of learning, and the pursuit of truth in many different forms, truth in science, but truth in business, what works and what doesn't work. Um, that's one of the nice things I got from my parents and I'm trying to pass on to my kids. My wife is also a PhD scientist, a biologist. So uh, we're trying to pass that on to our kids. So um, you, you mentioned in the book um, about asking about the questions your children uh, ask that day, not what they learned that day. Can you dig a little bit into this idea that you were just describing you learned from your parents, not asking about lessons, but asking about the questions they asked? Yeah, that was, uh, I remember reading that. It was a quote from a famous physicist, Isidore Rabi, who won the Nobel Prize in particle physics for his work in particle physics. And he was interviewed late in life by some, I think, school newspaper. You know, what does it take to win a Nobel Prize? Was there something in your childhood, something that your mother did that, you know, if sit you down this path? And he gave an answer that always stuck with me. He said that when he got home from school, his mother didn't ask him, What have you learned today? She asked him, did you ask any good questions today? And so I think that's a very useful way, not only to think about your family, but to think about your business, your business lines, if you're a leader, the people that you work with. Um, and it's there are many reasons that companies struggle to innovate, but one of them is a mindset around leader of focusing on answers and solutions rather than questions. When you focus on the right questions and get curious about, curious about the questions, why uh, is, did this customer group or this segment or this area of the industry, why are they doing things this way? And you really keep asking why, you can start to uncover something very interesting. So if you start to ask your, the folks that you work with, whether it's your teams, or other business leaders, not just how are you going to solve this problem, but what experiments might you run? What hypotheses can you test and how can you test them as creatively and as efficiently as possible? Instead of, you know, can you write a business plan for this product line? Is there a way to test this idea in one day in a hundred dollars? That's a really interesting question. And it's surprising how many times instead of you know, spending six months and writing a business plan for $5 million to launch a new product or service, you can find a way to test, to run a test or an experiment in a much shorter time. If you're equally creative about your test, you could, all these sort of interesting creative ways to run tests or experiments to validate hypotheses quickly. So asking questions helps get you to new ideas, new opportunities, new ways to run tests, new ways to get insight into your business. So that curiosity, the same thing that Isidro Rabi's mother asked him, is an interesting thing to start asking your teams and your team leaders, not just 
what are the answers, but what questions did you ask? So I, I love that. And when I when you go back or think back to 2001, when you were launching Cinta, um, and it was just an idea at the time, and you're it was right, I guess, in the midst of the dot com crash and kind of um, during incredibly turbulent times, you had some questions you were looking to get answered. What do you do? You remember what those questions were at the beginning of of Cinta? I was full of questions, but um, one of the actually questions that I found most useful that I did, I was, you know, I, that was 20 years ago. So I was a pretty <laughs> young guy uh, running my first business. Um, but one of the questions I found most interesting and most helpful to ask uh, was I found everyone. I would try to meet with folks who had been very successful in life as in business and uh, as leaders in whatever area. And instead of asking them, you know, what made you successful? I asked them one question, which was, what do you wish you had done differently? And I found I learned so much from those discussions, far more than if you ask somebody you know, why were you successful? Because you ask a successful retired CEO, why were you successful? You could listen for two hours and then patting themselves on the back about I was brilliant. I created a great culture. I was a genius. My competitors were dummies or whatever. Um, but it's very hard to separate that from being lucky, being in the right place at the right time. And not many business leaders will say, well, I was just, you know, it's in the right place at the right time. Or, you know, I had the right guy, you know, person helping me out. Whereas if you ask them what they wish they had done differently, they'll never say, well, I was in the right place at the right time. Really thoughtful leaders will have spent a lot of time trying to understand that and dissect it and break it out. And that's where the gold is. There's a lot of useful lessons. So the question I think I was most glad I asked was definitely what, what do you wish you had done differently? And um, if you were to think back on that entire experience, what is it that you wish you had done differently with Cinta? Uh, if anything, oh, there, there are many things that I wish I would have done differently. But you know what? What's really funny, almost, almost ironic, is that the answer that I got uh, most frequently from successful leaders: "What do I wish I'd done differently?" was probably the same answer I would give now, which shows how hard it is to get it right, which is most often the answer they gave was, I wish I had moved more quickly to, get, to move out or transition to replace people who didn't fit inside our organization for whatever reason. Um, I just thought that was so interesting. And 20 years later, <laughs> If there was one, one big thing I, I probably would agree because it's so easy, especially when you're at a startup, it's different when you're at a large company and let's say you're Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or whatever, who has a great brand or, you know, Google or Amazon, and there are 15 people for each slot. Well, if someone's not making it, you're out very easy to relatively speaking do, but when you're at a startup or a small or mid-sized company, that's much harder because you don't have 50,000 people for each job. You don't have backup. So it's much harder to do. And it's very easy to fall in the short-term trap of saying, well, we'll get by with this. We can fix this. We can work around this. It's okay. You know, you might, um, and you don't realize the long-term costs of, uh, of something that's not a good fit um, and how you're not helping anybody or not doing anybody any favors by failing to act quickly so that's one of many things i wish i would have done differently yeah you know at, at startup health we have this framework called the health transformer mindset and the mindset being such a powerful um tool and muscle and thing to continue working on um yourself but then you start to talk about the mindset of the others on your team or the mindset of the organizations you work with I really want to translate that now into this idea of loon shots, and in particular, your definition of a loon shot versus a moon shot, and how to differentiate which is the activity 
which is the goal, and ultimately using that filter a little bit to make decisions about people on your team, people that you invite to invest, to work with you, to collaborate with you? Uh, well, you know, Moonshot is declaring a big goal, like you had done your video, John F. Kennedy, that was the original origin of the term, when in 1961, he said, well, let's put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Um, but the big ideas, the big breakthroughs are the ones that most people ridicule as crazy. Their champions are written off as and dismissed. For example, everybody knows the story of Kennedy, but not many people remember that the reason we got to the moon was because 40 years earlier, a man named Robert Goddard suggested this crazy idea of blowing up gases inside a tin you know, inside a metal tin can to launch launch those tin cans into space, you know, liquid fuel jet propulsion. He invented the basic ideas and principles of rocketry. In fact, when he first suggested it in, 19, in the 1920s, New York Times wrote an editorial saying, this fellow Goddard doesn't understand the basic laws of physics. In space, there's nothing to push against. So you can't explode and get forward propulsion in space. This person has no idea what we, you know, even what we teach kids in high school and completely dismissed him and his ideas. And what was funny was uh, in July of uh, 1969, the day after the successful Apollo uh, launch of the rocket to the moon, the New York Times printed a retraction saying, uh, uh, we apologize and apparently, uh, Rocket flight does not violate 17th century physics. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the point of that is that moonshot is a destination, a big goal that everybody's excited about, but just declaring those goals won't do much for you other than you know create some feel-good moments, which is useful. But if you really want to get there, you need to create systems for nurturing moonshots inside your team and inside your company and that creating that system is very tricky. It's very difficult for the reasons I describe in Loon Shots and how you create that system, how the kind of elements you want in leadership, the mindset elements, the structural elements is very tricky. How do you balance wanting to have, you know, artists who are working on wild new ideas that can change how people see the world, you know, artist science, creative science, where you want things to fail. Because if you're not failing, you have a very big problem. You're not taking enough risk. And your competitor who is failing and breaking, you know, those first nine things to discover that 10th thing, um, that competitor will succeed and you'll discover it too late when it's a bullet to your head. So how do you balance sort of the artists who are working on stuff that you expect to fail and you want to fail versus the soldiers who are working on, let's say, parachutes that you don't want to fail. You want a parachute to open the same way every time. So the need to have sort of this artists and soldiers working together inside the company, how do you create those systems? How do you create those structures? They're doing the opposite thing. One, you want to encourage risk-taking and encourage failure. And the other, you want to discourage failure. You don't want your sales guy knocking on a customer's door and saying, oh, here's, here's your toaster, sir. Toaster, I ordered a television. And then you, you won't have a business. So you, one, you want to increase risk, one, you want to decrease risk. And if you don't understand that basic principle, then you're just going to get mush. You're just going to get a mess. And you're going to get chaos. So that's kind of what Moonshots is about, is how do you build this system to do both? So I want to dig into your ice cube metaphor uh, that you talk about in the book. But before I do, one of the questions that came in from one of our health transformers, Dr. Uh, Alex Greenhill, was how do you distinguish with loon shots between crazy, crazy and crazy awesome? Like, where does that line get drawn on the on the loon shot side of things? And is there a distinction? Yeah. And oh, by the way, I should say for. Uh... Uh, since we're all in the biomedical space, anyone on, who hears this or is on this call and wants a 
free chapter of Loon Shots where I get into some of the basic ideas and the artist soldiers and some World War II history, what really happened in World War II and how this principle helped turn the course of that war. You can just email me at uh, my first name at last name, Safi at Bacall.com and I'll, I'll send you a PDF. Um, so how do you distinguish between the truly crazy? I get a lot of those. I get like 10 or 20 or 30, well, probably more than that, people reaching out a week on, um, you know, whether it's CEOs or leadership teams come work with us and designing this sort of system and balancing, you know, the artists, the, the create, you know, the building the ecosystem to nurture loon shots better uh, or people with their own crazy loon shot ideas. So how do you tell the difference? It comes down to what I think of as LSC. It's another, you talked about mindset. That's a mindset that I found very useful in terms of what I wish I had done differently as well. I wish I'd understood that principle a little earlier in my career, but I don't have a good memory. So LSC is an acronym. Listen to the suck with curiosity. And here's what I mean by that. Most people, uh, you know, many people just ignore the negatives and just plow straight ahead. But there, you know, if you've been through management training, they tell you to, you know, repeat back what you've heard and so forth. But that's still not good enough. The really, the best scientists and entrepreneurs that I've worked with, one common characteristic is that they listen to the suck with curiosity, meaning they get really curious when a customer doesn't like something or a product doesn't work or something, you know, the market is sort of rejecting what they're doing rather than getting defensive. And it's very hard because if you put your heart and soul into mm -hmm. something and somebody tells you, I don't like it, your first reaction is you want to punch them in the face. Right. Or, I'm not gonna want, or I'm not going to fund it or I'm not going to, yeah, it's exactly. all the same. You want yeah. to, you know, and venture capitalists know this, which is why they rarely deliver truly honest feedback. You know, they say, oh, I would love to invest. This is great. You're brilliant. But, uh, you know, my fund and we just did this other thing and it closed or, I, you know, I have to walk my cat, you know, it's three o'clock. <laughs> you know, they'll give all these excuses rather than tell you what's actually useful. And so the, which is what you can change or improve. And that's where the gold is. And so the really successful entrepreneurs, their skill set isn't so much in coming up with new ideas because lots of people have ideas. Their skill set is in teasing out, getting really curious, taking off the defensive hat and putting on the Sherlock Holmes hat and say, huh, can you help me understand what about it really didn't resonate? Like if there was one thing, and people don't want to tell you that. Why? because it's a difficult conversation and they want you to be friends. If they're a venture capitalist, they want you to come back with the next idea after this one will certainly die. They actually want you to come back with your next, the next idea, not to their competing venture capitalist. So they want to be friends. So they're not going to tell you something where they think you'll be defensive. So, but that's what you need. So the really great entrepreneurs and scientists that I've met, it's the same thing in the science world, have developed very specialized skills in teasing out that feedback. They might even go to a third party and say, listen, could you ask your friend what he or she did or didn't like or what resonated because they're comfortable telling you, not to my face. And they go through a third party to get it. Or the same thing with customers. And then when you find out, like eventually when you tease it out, you know, a customer or, or a partner might say, and they didn't want to tell you this, but well, you know, there's a company in Sweden that's making the same thing at about, you know, half the price with this extra two features. And then you're like, really? I, didn't, I never even heard about that. And you go look and like, oh my goodness, they do have these two features. And you know what? Those features that they're adding, we could do it better. Right. Huh. So that's where the gold is. So how do you tell the difference between the really crazy ideas? One, the really good entrepreneurs who are onto something Firstly, they understand this LSC, listening to the suck with curiosity. And so they're, when you give them not so great news, they probe and they ask rather than get defensive. And number two is they have another hypothesis. So someone who just comes, my idea is great. Uh, okay, well, what's your experiment and hypothesis to test? <laughs> 
you know, people who are just crazy don't have any experiments or hypotheses or are not that interested in finding them. People who are really good have an experiment or hypothesis, and if it doesn't work, they have another one, and they keep going. They bridge on the. Anyone who's been an entrepreneur and innovator knows that your first idea, second idea, third idea almost never works. But the people who survive are the ones who have a continuous cycle of hypotheses and experiments and test them well. So those are sort of two litmus tests. Yeah. If someone comes in with the skill to listen with curiosity and to tease out and find some interesting insights in things that are negative or things that don't work, number one. And number two, they have a series of experiments and hypotheses that's a very positive sign. If they don't, that's not a good sign. I, I love that. And, and it actually connects with, I think, the community of entrepreneurs and startup health in particular, because we do do some back channel feedback on, on, on a regular basis with our network for them when they're pitching and getting them and giving them that kind of candid feedback. But I think sometimes it's difficult to hear. And what you just described is a really powerful way of doing it with confidence, right? So doing the listening to the suck with curiosity. Um, there's another concept connected to this around expecting the three deaths. And I'm fascinated by it because I know there are entrepreneurs who get to the second death and they're done. And that's why the mindset becomes such an important muscle to work because you got to keep going. Can you describe the three deaths, your own experience with it, and then the observation of how many different examples there are in our everyday lives around things that um, only hit their greatness um, and uh, achieved their loon shot once they experienced and expected the three deaths? Sure. And it's kind of the opposite of the fail fast and pivot Silicon Valley mantra. But if you look at the really successful companies or inventions, um, companies that have understood this mindset are actually very few. Amazon happens to be one of them. And I just got spent some time at Lab 126, you know, there's their secret innovation lab in Santa Clara and um, at Google X and then Microsoft R&D group. And people who um, have become very good at this systematically understand the three deaths. And I'll explain that the story behind it was... Uh, uh, when I was running this biotech company, we had an R and D team, and one of our advisors was a guy named Sir James Black, who won the Nobel Prize for developing two of the most important drug categories of the 20th century. And he would come over. He was about 80 uh, at the time, and I was less. Th uh, I was about half his age, l less than half his age, I think. And uh, you know, I remember one night. Uh, I've been like a 10 hour R and D kind of portfolio review session with him. And I was like, like falling off my chair, ready to go home and crawl into bed. But he was like, Oh, Safi, stay and have another drink. He was Scottish. And so he wanted, you know, drink some scotch. And I was like, okay, <laughs> how can you do this? Like you just flew over the Atlantic and like 12 hour, 10, 12 hour session. And like, you want to drink? Um, but I still, you looking kind of, glum what's up and i said well you know we had the project in the lab that we were really excited about and unfortunately we got some negative data it didn't seem to work in these models and these experiments and he said ah oh, it's my boy it's not a good drug unless it's been killed three times and that started me thinking about if you look at the course of the history of so many inventions so many discoveries almost uni uniformly, they failed many times before they succeeded, whether it was, you know, Facebook in IT, Facebook was famously not the fairest social network. It was, you know, there'd been two dozen prior ones. Google was like the 18th search engine, even the transistor, you know, when it launched, people had no idea what to, after they built it, it failed in all sorts of possible applications and people didn't know what to do with it for four or five years until someone suggested hearing aids. And so the first application wasn't, you know, oh, let's build a computer. The first application was this minor little application called, you know, hearing aid. Um, so, and certainly drug discovery, that's the case. I, I tell the story of the statins, how they were killed several times. Um, I tell a little bit of the story of Judah Folkman and 
discovering a new way to treat cancer with blocking tumor blood flow and how that felt, you know, was killed three times, sometimes five times, sometimes 10 times. Yeah. And the basic principle there is this. If the discovery succeeds on the first time, it's probably not that important. Why? Because lots of people probably did it. If it fails once, twice, three times, that means it might end up being important. Why? Because a lot of people went away. That's exactly what happened with the statins. They didn't work in the mouse models, which is usually the, is the first step. That's usually kind of a gold standard, go, no go criteria. And almost every company exited the field at that time. There were other trials for cholesterol inhibitors that failed, you know, dietary trials didn't work. Other drugs that seemed to inhibit cholesterol didn't work. You know, that would be another death. Then there was some, what later turned out to be spurious, you know, fake, uh, not real reports of toxicology uh, findings in dogs. And then the entire field just gave up, um, except for one person who persisted and developed what became drug that ended up cumulative sales of a third of a trillion dollars, say it prevented millions of heart attack, changed heart disease forever, but it went through the three deaths. And that's so many stories. And that's why it's important to keep in mind if you're thinking about innovation um, and trying new things, what Jim Black told me, which is it's probably not a good idea unless it's been killed three times. I love it. And that, that ties together, you, bl you, you blended in the false fail um, in there. Um, and, and I think oftentimes, because we hear this from the entrepreneurs, you know, we've invested in about 360 or 70 companies over the last 10 years. Um, dozens have been acquired, dozens have gone out of business and closed up, but there are 80% of them still working on their multiple lives, so to speak. Some of them hitting it very early, some of them taking a lot longer. But that false fail, distinguishing between a failure like you just described and attributing it to one thing versus falsely thinking it's connected to something else. Can you describe the false fail and how important it is to distinguish? Sure. And so, uh, yeah, like I said, I, when I do workshops with teams or companies, this is one of the things that we talk about is the importance of analyzing failures well, because you think of sort of like a level zero team, just something fails, they just keep going. And a level one in strategy is you uh, analyze the outcome and say, well, it failed, uh, you know, whether it's our product or characteristic, it didn't meet or didn't succeed, uh, you know, for this reason. So let's, you know, not have that feature or that product or do this or do a different experiment. But the really thoughtful, strategic, uh, and ultimately successful companies have a bake into their system understanding and analyzing failure for a couple of reasons. One is the false fail, which I'll explain. And the other is understanding the difference between a good fail versus a bad fail for your people and for your team and for how you manage your business. So, so there's two different concepts, independent mm -hmm. variables. So a false fail is when there's a flaw in the experiment, not in the idea. So we mentioned, I mentioned the statins. So when they tested, when Akira Endo came up with the idea and developed the first stat from in Japan, uh, first tested it in mouse models, it showed absolutely nothing. It's a complete failure. And that's when one of the stages where a lot of companies give up. But he suspected for reasons that he had uh, thought about that there might be a species difference. There might be something funny in mice. As it turns out, in hindsight, retroactively, mice don't have LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. They only have good cholesterol. And statins work by lowering the bad cholesterol. Mice just happen to be one species that don't really have much LDL cholesterol. So when he ended up testing the drug in chickens, he found a big effect, and in dogs and in primates and in humans. But that's an example of a false fail where you could stop because there's a flaw in the experiment. I also gave the example of uh, the false fail of Friendster, 
when most people were looking to invest in, when Facebook was out there and Mark Zuckerberg was out there showing his idea around, everybody said, oh, social networks don't work. You see, there's this one now called Friendster and everybody's leaving it. Um, and there was one guy who went and got the data and saw that actually on the Friendster website, people were staying around on, on the web, on the program, on the app for a long time. The problem wasn't that the business model is bad or people didn't like using it and didn't or always wanted to leave to a new network like a fad. The problem was that their website kept crashing. They couldn't scale to millions of users. People were leaving because it was a technical glitch on the website. That was a false fail for the business model. And that's why almost every investor passed on Facebook, but not Peter Thiel, because he had figured out that false fail. So understanding the false fails is really going back and saying, was there some flaw in our experiment or some flaw to test the idea? Or is the idea really flawed? In order to do that, you have to step back and analyze how you are going, up, the, the cause of that failure, why that happened, and to see if you have a new hypothesis. In the case of Akira Endo, he had a hypothesis that there was a species difference, that mice might behave differently than dogs or primates. So it's very important to understand failure, firstly, because of this false fail problem. But secondly, if you want to encourage risk-taking, one of the biggest problems inside organizations, and this is the reason that you want to build a system, is fear of failure. That's even in... You know, when I'm inside companies that are known as the most innovative companies in the world, and I'm meeting with folks there and the teams there, they still struggle with fear of failure because failure has a stigma, right? And so you as the CEO may be want to encourage and say, everybody try stuff, it's okay. But if, if you're not the CEO, and you may have forgotten what it's like to be at the middle or be on the ground, it's not fun to fail. You can make excuses, but people, unless your company, does, your organization, the structures that you create have found ways to make it more acceptable, um, and there are ways to do that, and there are all sorts of interesting things that you can do about that, which you know we could talk about, or is one of the things that I do with, with teams. But in order to get good at that, you have to understand the difference between good fails and bad fails. So that's another concept. So a good fail is where you learn something, where you conducted the experiment well. It was a reasonable hypothesis and it was an experiment that was well conducted and you got valuable data. Example, Amazon's Fire Phone. That was a colossal, there is no Fire Phone today. It was a, a colossal failure. <clears throat> but in building the Fire Phone, they learned something incredibly valuable about their markets. Their customers saw Amazon as a value play, not a luxury play. And that taught them that they needed to be more on brand in their products. And they hadn't really appreciated that before. But even more in building the Fire Phone, they learned something pretty useful. Voice recognition. What did voice recognition end up being useful for? Alexa, which ended up being far more valuable for the company than, a, than another, you know, electronic gadget would have. So that's an example of a good fail. A bad, and that's what you wanna celebrate. You wanna celebrate good fails and there are ways to do that. A bad fail is when someone just starts something without a clear hypothesis, without, or conducts experiment in a sloppy way. You don't want those kind of failures. So the point of this is if you wanna innovate, if you wanna try something new, you really need to think get really good at failure, at listening to the suck with curiosity, at analyzing well enough to tell the difference between a false fail and a true fail, was the experiment conducted well? And number three, celebrating good fails, uh, separating good fails from bad fails so that you can celebrate the good fails. So all of that is part of a much larger umbrella. Yeah. Of, if you wanna innovate, let's think about how we as a team, as a company, as an organization create structures around failures. Right. So let, let's double click on that structure comment you made. You talk a lot about artists and soldiers, and I love your analogy of Steve Jobs, you know, version one at Apple and coming back and integrating Tim Cook in and and really the notion of not not treating them 
differently, um, but loving them both. And I just think, I know we don't have a lot of time to go deep on the concept, but I love the way you've simplified this to people could understand not treating your entire organization uh, in, in different groups of your organization differently than others um, and how that can wreak havoc. All right. So I'll, um, well, this is a glass of water. I often start with this analogy when I kind of first do first talk with teams and companies. And it can exist in two different forms. It can be liquid. And I stick my finger in and twirl it around. The water molecules just slosh around my finger. Or it could be completely rigid, ice. Two totally different patterns of behavior, sloshing around wildly, totally rigid. But it's the same exact molecules. So why do they behave totally differently? Just like you have some companies that are wildly innovative and embracing new ideas and some companies that are totally rigid and bureaucratic and rejecting new ideas. And it could be the same people. The same people can exhibit totally different patterns of behavior. And that's how you can think about cultures, those patterns of behavior that you can see. Structure is what can change those patterns of behavior. If structure is the equivalent of how do I raise or lower the temperature? No amount, then when I talk about structure inside companies, that's what I mean. The incentive systems, the things that you measure, the processes that you create, the systems that you design, how do you reward and incentivize failure or intelligent risk-taking? Those are the things that are the equivalent of dialing temperature. And here's why it matters. No amount of uh, holding hands or singing Kumbaya or forcing employees to watch two hour movies about brotherhood is gonna change culture. It's gonna change patterns of behavior. Just like yelling at the molecules in a block of ice, hey guys, could you just loosen up a little bit? <laughs> is not gonna melt that block of ice but a small change in temperature can get the job done. And so that's what I, you know, that's some of the details in loon shots or what I, we do with teams and companies in much more detail is what are those elements of structure? How do you build a system so that you can innovate at pace and scale so that you shift mindset? If there's one big thing, it's about shifting your mindset as a leader as your purpose as a company is to let's manage our product or grow our market share to how do we run experiments at pace and at scale? How do we create a continuous cycle of hypotheses experiments to test new idea? And how do we balance that to get to your question, the artists and soldiers without dropping the ball on being on time, on budget, on scale consistently with quality? For example, Steve Jobs, which I, as you mentioned, I wrote about, you had this kind of legendary artist, Johnny Ive, who ran the design group there. And if you have an Apple product, it probably came out of a uh, design from his group, who was just one of these all-time great product designers. And when the iPad came out, it was a beautiful design from his group. But if it wasn't for Tim Cook, who was sort of the ultimate soldier, who got the cost down from $6,000 to $600, there'd be no Apple today. In other words, moral of the story, you need to love your artists and soldiers equally. You need to create separate structures for them because what you know, artist science or artist product development or trying crazy new things needs different things that you measure, different things that you reward, different ways of working with them, originality, creativity, incentivizing intelligent risk-taking and running experiments and getting a lot of failures versus the soldier, it's exact opposite. You need to have a different hat, a different mindset when you work with the artists and soldiers, but you need to love them both equally. And it comes down to what I think of sometimes as the beautiful baby problem. The artist working on the beautiful new thing, whether it's a molecule in a lab or a new coffee machine design, they see their creation as this beautiful new baby full of potential. And the soldier sees a shriveled up raisin covered in vomit and poop. Beautiful baby, vomit and poop. <laughs> And they're both right. You want that tension. People who you want the liquid, you know, sloshing around and you want the solid discipline, but you need to create the different structures and love them both. And if you, the people who say, oh, let's just get rid of the tension and everybody do both are making a big mistake. You can't be liquid and solid at the same time and tell everybody, yeah, be liquid, be solid, be liquid, be solid. You just get 
slush. You need to understand that you have these two types of things. You need to create different structures for them. And if you're the leader, you need to love both equally. And whether that's different roles, if you're a very large company, you can create different roles. But if you're inside a small team or even just a solo entrepreneur, it's different time. Creating a time and a structure and a day a week or a day a month or a weekend, you know, a quarter where you just have your artist time and they're exploring crazy new stuff. And the rest of the time, the soldier time, let's pick the first three and then get the, march the ball down the field on these first three ideas. Yeah, I love that framework. And another concept, there's so many wonderful concepts that are very applicable to what's happening now in healthcare. And in particular, I think the world changed last year in so many ways, but the, the, the before COVID world for entrepreneurs trying to innovate in healthcare and the after COVID world seem to be radically different in, in many ways. Um, what, from your perspective as an entrepreneur and innovator, especially having been one during very uncertain times back in 2001 when you launched the company, what do you think is really important for entre entrepreneurs in a, in a you know, COVID slash after COVID world to do differently than maybe a couple of years ago when it, you know, perhaps the world and a lot of the things were different? I think it's to watch out for another common trap, which is that I, I see in companies all the time. There's a whole list of sort of common traps um, that companies make, especially as they scale. So actually a lot of the CEOs that I work with are in this sort of hyper growth, either pre-IPO or post-IPO phase. And there were five people in a garage and, you know, things were really easy and exciting and fun. And now something hit in product market and things are going well. How do we put in place these systems? So a common trap that's especially important to fix post-COVID is the focus exclusively on product. I'm thinking innovation equals product. And I write about P type or product type versus S type or strategy type. And I give the example of Pan Am, which was a great company and a brilliant product innovator, he brought in place uh, the first jet engine, uh, first around the world, uh, uh, you know, transatlantic flights, transpacific flights, but kept innovating on product and engine when its industry went through this big shock of deregulation. What mattered was strategy. What mattered was the much less glamorous loon shots of frequent fire miles of giving away your reservation system to every travel agent for free. That's what American Airlines did. So there were 300 airlines that went bankrupt after deregulation, the big shock back then, just like we had COVID was our big shock now. So 300 airlines went bankrupt except for one, American Airlines. They had no fancy product innovations. They weren't on the cover of any magazines. There were no celebrity endorsements, but they kept doing these things that required no new products, rapid turnaround times at airports, hub and spoke model, the frequent flyer I mentioned, giving away their travel reservation system, which became Sabre uh, and eventually spun out. And it was those little strategy innovations that saved them. So when you go through a big crisis, it's the companies who innovate just as well on strategy, not just product that end up doing well. And by strategy, this is a whole nother series of discussions. I mean, not just external strategy, what's our goals, but it's internal strategy. How do we work with vendors? How do we work with suppliers? Complementary strategy. What products are we using? What channels are we using? What distributions are we using? What partnerships do we have? What are the forms of our partnerships? So when I, and this is a very easy thing to miss, especially in tech, especially in healthcare, where people think innovation equals better product. But actually the people who will, then you're just Pan Am, just making better engines and you will disappear like Pan Am disappeared. What you want to do, the companies that were super successful are the ones who, who are able to do both, innovate just as well on strategy as they do on product. And so that matters, especially when you're coming out the other end of a crisis and your competitors have been adapting because the old strategies didn't work when everybody is made these big changes associated with the crisis and they're coming up with new strategies and new models. And if you don't, you will be left behind just like Pan Am was. 
Love it. Well, I, I've, uh, I've, I could do this for hours, as I mentioned um, before we even started this. I was trying to figure out how to make sure that we condense it down into an hour. Um, what's your next book called? I know you're, you're working on a new book, or at least that's been teased out there. Uh, any preview? Uh, still a little early. It's extending the principles of why in Loon Shots, which is kind of these science of phase transitions of why groups suddenly change behavior like the glass of water to markets, marketplaces, markets and finance, but marketplaces for ideas as well. And what that tells you about market, how that explains many years of mysteries about the behavior of markets. Does, does that go deeper into the loon shot nursery concept, which you, you talked about in the book, um, that idea? Because I think it applies in startup health world where we really have built a loon shot factory of entrepreneurs and innovators working on achieving health loon shots. But does that apply at the markets level when you talk about your next kind of thesis of, of macro? Yeah, there are many ideas that poured over and a whole bunch of new ideas that I hope will be interesting to folks. So stay excellent, tuned. excellent. excellent. Um, you mentioned working with companies, uh, big companies like Google and Facebook. Do you work with startups? Can startups kind of contact you? Is there anything other than reading your books and, and watching your blog? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I gave you guys my email. I think it's in the chat, Safi at Bacall.com. And uh, I have, I do have a, a small handful of kind of CEOs that I work with behind the scenes to be, um, you know, you and I were talking about YPO. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I enjoyed YPO for, you know, 10, 15, some years and still do some of that. But one thing I wish I would have done differently is have one person I could confide in who was outside my executive team and outside my board that I could talk to, uh, let my hair down and really bounce crazy ideas off of. And YPO is good, but not great for that. You want someone because it's, you know, once a month and you have two hours or whatever you want. And one thing I would have, I wish I, I would have done differently was that I would have had somebody I could talk to because I used someone on my board for that yeah. on occasions. And that's not the same. Yeah, your, it's your very different. Is, your, your board of directors yeah. is your boss. You don't really let down your hair with your boss. You don't say, oh, I, you know, I'm having trouble with my CFO. I don't think I should, you know, should I do X or should I do Y? Well, then you've just thrown your CFO under a bus, even if yeah, you, yeah. you change your well, mind later. So. That was the thesis behind launching Startup Health 10 years ago, really, to build a global army of connected entrepreneurs who can rely on each other as peer advisors and otherwise to provide exactly what kind of support you're providing. So I, I do that with a, a handful of kind of probably not, you know, five person or 10 person companies, but yeah. um, because there are a lot of pure startup focused people, but more on that scale, something is working. How do we scale it? Because you're too big for like a VC but you don't want to bring in McKinsey or Bain. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you would appreciate someone you could just talk to, to give you a little bit of outside feedback and uh, bounce ideas off of in a safe space where you don't have to talk about it to your board or executive team if you don't want to. So I, I would have benefited from that when I was younger. So it's fun for me to work with some younger CEOs and uh, be there for them. And I, I do enjoy that. That's fun.